Uh, welcome to Tokyo College YouTube channel. Um, today's speaker is Professor Haruo Shirane. He is Shincho Professor of Japanese Literature and Culture and also Director of Donald King Center of Japanese Culture at Columbia University in the United States of America. Professor Shirane has been staying with us at Tokyo College for six months since last November and he is going to give a lecture on animals, disasters, and mountains, rethinking environmental humanities. After the lecture by Professor Shirane, I would like to invite a commentator, Dr. Fukunaga Mayumi. She is an expert in environmental uh, sociology and ethics. Now I would like to hand over the microphone to Professor Shirane. I hope uh, um, Professor Shirane is now ready to speak. Thank you. Uh, I'm a scholar of classical Japanese literature and culture. Uh, I'm not an environmental scientist or an environmental policy maker. Uh, the question that I will be raising today is, can the study of <clears throat> pre-modern or classical Japanese literature and folklore have meaning for uh, environmental studies? The answer, I hope, is definitely uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> in Japan, the humanities have recently been viewed as useless for solving contemporary issues, but this is uh, far from uh, truth. Uh, environmental crisis uh, is not just a political or scientific problem. It is a cultural problem. Uh, it is about the ways in which we think about and interact with the uh, environment. Uh, Lawrence Buell has uh, pointed out, uh, quote, for technological breakthroughs, legislative reform, paper covenants about environment to take effect, or even to be generated in the first place, requires a climate of transformed environmental values, uh, perception, and will. To that end, the power of story, image, and artistic performance, and the resources of aesthetics, ethics, and cultural theory are crucial." Unquote. Uh, I will address one of the key issues to, debated today by cultural anthropologists and environmentalists. That is to say the relationship of the human to the non-human and its implication for ecology and environmental uh, ethics. Perhaps the most pressing, one of the most pressing questions of our time in the age of the Anthropocene is how to see and experience the world not from the eyes of the human, but from those of the non-human. <clears throat> How can such a non-human perspective help us in the age of disasters? Uh, I take up this question by looking at the culture of the Satoyama uh, village uplands, a focal point of traditional Japanese agriculture and ecology, uh, not as a site of, quote, human harmony with nature, unquote, as has been widely argued, uh, but as a site of <clears throat> uh, conflict and disaster. Uh, <clears throat> close to 80% of the landmass of Japan is uh, mountains, and most of the agriculture occurs at the foot of the mountains in villages in a basin or valley where there's river and water. Uh, in the 12th and 13th centuries, uh, almost simultaneously in Western Europe and in Japan, there was a agricultural revolution. Uh, in Western Europe, the forests were largely destroyed and turned into uh, farmland. The clear land was not used, that was not used for farming, <clears throat> became pasture for sheep, goats, cows, uh, etc. In Japan, uh, the forest was also destroyed but the forest was also restored, uh, creating secondary forest, uh, <clears throat> such as red pine cypress. And this became a rich source for uh, rice culture and creating a self-sustaining socio-economic 
ecological system now called uh, Satoyama. Uh, the major features of this uh, uh, Satoyama uh, are the two crop uh, system, uh, use of oxen and hoe irrigation technology, uh, the Satoyama <clears throat> extended from the rice fields to the village to the mountain slopes uh, and included the uh, replanted forests. Uh, uh, and the forest uh, provided, including recycled human waste, uh, natural fertilizer for rice uh, agriculture. Uh, Takeuchi Kazuhiko, uh, leading environmentalist, has also given a broader definition of Satoyama to include farming villages next to a forest uh, <clears throat> or well field. Um, this kind appears on uh, <coughs> plateau with uh, buckwheat and potatoes instead of rice. Um, so <clears throat> uh, you can see here the uh, coppice, which is the replanted forest versus the uh, deeper uh, <clears throat> in the mountains, uh, which has more natural forest. Uh, another, uh, in, here in this slide, you can see kind of the self-sustaining um, uh, ecosystem in which they bring uh, <clears throat> underbrush and uh, leaves from the forest uh, for fertilizer. Uh, another key to understanding Jap Japan's environment is this, what's called the satoyumi or village sea, a uh, new term designed to in indicate the integration of fishing village with neighboring water and sea. Uh, <clears throat> the Japanese archipelago uh, has almost endless seashores. Uh, it's blessed with uh, two major currents. It gives uh, uh, the Japanese uh, fresh fish and seafood all year round. Uh, uh, and this includes uh, cultivated fish, uh, grown shellfish, farm plankton, et cetera. Uh, and since Japan has one of the longest uh, coastlines in the world, <clears throat> this makes uh, the Satomi a uh, major socio-ecological -eco system. Uh, despite the bounty uh, of uh, both the Satoyama and the Satomi, uh, Japan actually faces an agricultural crisis. Uh, in 1965, it produced 73% of its food by 200. 2009, only 39%, uh, and it produces the smallest amount uh, among in industrial nations. One of the reasons is the rapid decline of the Satoyama shift from fish uh, and rice to wheat and meat, and particularly uh, beef. Um, there are other various other reasons, including the shift from coal to natural gas and oil in the 1960s. Um, we can say that uh, the future of the environment uh, lies in large part on the fate of the Satoyama and the uh, Satoumi. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Takeuchi uh, Kazuhiko has uh, noted that <clears throat> the Satoyama, along with uh, wind, solar, biomass, uh, and geothermal, are keys to uh, renewable energy if Japan is to achieve. Uh, <clears throat> Its government pledged to reduce CO2 by 2050. Uh, so this represents a, a chance for the Satoyama to make a comeback. Uh, in his analysis of uh, Satoyumi, Yanagi Tetsuo, who uh, is the one who coined the term Satoyumi, uh, comes to the following conclusion. The commons, that's the common shared uh, <clears throat> sphere of natural resources, uh, <clears throat> stands on the border of nature and humans. Here, human nature is humanized and humans are naturalized. Only then does the commons become sustainable, unquote. <clears throat> uh, in Satomi and Satoyama, nature is managed to a certain extent by humans, but humans must give up part of themselves to share. <clears throat> uh, if they don't, the commons cannot be maintained, resulting in so-called tragedy of the commons. Uh, and Yanagi 
uh, sites experience of mountain people in <clears throat> the region in Echigo who share similar views of uh, the Satoyama quote, if the mountain and human both kill half, there's a desire that is about uh, right. So uh, recently, well, at least since the 1990s, there's also been the rise of what we could call uh, eco-nationalism uh, or Satoyama nationalism. <clears throat> the uh, argument goes that Western cultures exploited uh, or destroyed nature for human profit. Uh, by contrast, Japan, as exemplified by Satoyama, have coexist, quote, quote, coexisted with nature. The Japanese, uh, quote, uh, live in harmony with nature um, or are uh, gentler with uh, nature. Uh, and this uh, view is uh, <clears throat> apparent in env environmental philosophies as well as uh, Ministry of en Environment Policy. Uh, statements. Uh, in my book, uh, Culture of the Four Seasons, uh, <clears throat> in Japanese, Sozo Sareta Shiki no Sozo, I show that this is basically a myth uh, that Japan actually created a complex and extended uh, secondary nature in the cities and in rural areas through the Satoyama that created an image of uh, harmony with nature. And that was uh, frequently in, in <clears throat> contrast to that everyday reality of uh, disaster, disease, famine, and destruction of uh, nature. Moreover, we cannot uh, claim that Satoyama is a exclusively Japanese phenomenon. Actually, uh, <clears throat> Pan Asian uh, extends from India through China and Korea, Indonesia, Philippines, and so forth. The term Satayama was first popularized by Shide Tsunahide uh, in the 1960s and 70s during Japan's uh, economic uh, expansion when the Satayama was slipping away. Uh, and today the Satayama uh, is in the process of evolving into a socioeconomic system that includes ecotourism, organic farming, et cetera. Uh, and also broader intersections with the global economy. Uh, so while eco-nationalism can be a strong motivator for uh, uh, <clears throat> environmental activism, uh, this paper uh, and this lecture today avoids romanticizing the Satoyama as a lost past or an ideal of human harmony with nature, and instead explores the Satoyama uh, as a key site of conflict and uh, catastrophe. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so I will <clears throat> now turn to the uh, <clears throat> issue of mountains. Uh, so historically, the Satoyama has often been abused and stripped of trees, creating what was called the bald mountain or Hagayama uh, phenomenon, leading to landslides, uh, etc. Now, are forcing animals uh, into the villages. Even today, this uh, occurs. <clears throat> Equally important, uh, and I think this needs to be stressed. Uh, Japan is a land of natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunami. Uh, live volcanoes, drought, floods, mountain landslides, typhoons, uh, etc. In pre-modern Japan, summer especially was uh, a month of disease and death due to heat and humidity. <clears throat> um, I want to turn now to uh, Mount Fuji just to uh, exemplify uh, this relationship of mountains to uh, catastrophe. Um, so Mount Fuji was uh, worshipped as a god or kami, not simply because it was beautiful uh, or rich source of uh, water, uh, because it because it brought uh, natural uh, disasters. The first recorded ones uh, in the eighth century 
quote, continued day and night covering the area in volcanic ash and turning the waters of the river rivers red, unquote. Uh, from the 19th century, uh, Mount Fuji is referred to in the documents as the Asama Great God. Um, and in 1853, the court uh, conferred on <clears throat> Mount Fuji this uh, special rank of Jusanmi, uh, junior third rank, uh, probably in response to the earlier uh, earthquakes. So that is to say that Mount Fuji was rewarded as an elevated person, uh, not anthropomorphized, uh, but <clears throat> elevated uh, and <clears throat> deserving of high rank. So a powerful uh, person that the mountain brought people blessings, but if it was ignored or offended, for example, by causing defilement, uh, it caused uh, evol volcanic uh, eruptions and natural disasters. Uh, so in the pre-modern period, uh, kami uh, were embedded in the mountains and sea. Uh, they weren't transcendental gods, uh, but rather powerful spirits uh, embedded in various aspects of nature. Uh, and this is a famous quote from Motori no Ninaga describing the kami. Uh, uh, they are coming with extraordinary virtue, and they are coming that are to be feared. There are many kinds of coming: those of high status, those of low status, strong ones and weak ones, good ones and bad ones. Uh, they think and act in different ways, and as a consequence, it is hard to define them. Uh, the main uh, point uh, <clears throat> of interest here is uh, that nature was filled with these uh, raging gods. Uh, Araburu Kami, uh, and basically had two sides. Uh, one was peaceful, protective, Nikimitama, and the other side was wild and destructive, uh, Aramitama. So uh, the same god could have uh, two sides. Uh, so the volcanoes in Japan uh, produced, uh, uh, brought rich soil and water. Uh, making the uh, uplands ideal for farming, but the same uh, volcanoes can explode, bringing a uh, massive uh, disaster. <clears throat> uh, in addition, uh, mountains were a constant, uh, were, were thought to bring renewal and new life. Uh, by the late 9th century, uh, the eastern provinces uh, around uh, Mount Fuji uh, a strong bond between Shugendo, or mountain worship, and Buddhism, and uh, Shugendo practice, practitioners climbed uh, and trained in the mountains, such as uh, Mount Fuji, uh, in order to purify uh, spirit and body, to get rid of defilements, uh, uh, and uh, to renew uh, life uh, and health. <clears throat> and uh, the mountains were thought to have both heaven and hell, and uh, by experiencing both sides of the mountain, one could achieve uh, rebirth. Um, and this is, uh, uh, and, and Shugendo was probably the most popular religion in pre-modern uh, Japan. Uh, there's two types, the sh sh mountain Shugendo in which basically mainly restricted to men and dedicated practitioners, but also village uh, shugendo, uh, in which those who had uh, practiced in the mountains came down to the villages and helped to cure uh, and protect those uh, in the villages. Uh, and in the Edo period, uh, when many residents uh, moved to the uh, large cities, uh, they often joined a, a core religious association such as the Fujiko, the uh, Mount Fuji Worship Association <clears throat> that sent out uh, representatives to um, bring back benefits uh, and, and power of Mount Fuji. And here you see uh, <clears throat> Fujiko and followers going to the mountains. Uh, <clears throat> I want to turn to, uh, so here's the trinity here uh, of the mountain. I'm going to turn now to the animals um, in the Satoyama. 
Uh, and this gives you a quick overview of uh, different types of animals uh, at, at different strata in, in the Satoyama. So in the deep mountain, uh, we have uh, deer, wild boar, bear, uh, and then the mountain foothills, which is part of the Satoyama, and this is kind of the shared commons, uh, this fox, tanuki, monkey, uh, et cetera. And then in the village, we have uh, more domesticated uh, animals. So the deep uh, mountains, uh, or Okuyama, uh, were basically untouched by humans, uh, except for hunting, whereas the Satoyama uh, is where uh, humans and non and animals uh, coexisted. Uh, now, one of the striking things in Japanese literature and Japanese folklore is the overwhelming number of tales uh, about marriage between humans and, and animals, <clears throat> particularly the animals in the uh, Satoyama. Uh, and here's some just some of the example of uh, interspecies marriage uh, that occurs um, and also includes trees. Uh, one of the earliest examples is uh, and most famous is in the um, Kojiki in the early chronicles um, uh, in which a man uh, meets uh, Lady Toyotama, alligator at the bottom of the sea. Uh, she bears him a child but when her identity is discovered, uh, she returns to the sea and Toyotama sends her sister to look after the child whom she marries <clears throat> and who becomes the first emperor of Japan. Uh, so the imperial family uh, traces its roots to a wild animal, uh, which accounts for the family's uh, province, prominence uh, and the animal represents uh, power and authority. One of the most uh, famous uh, <clears throat> stories, uh, particularly famous in the early modern period, is uh, the marriage between uh, a human and a fox in uh, the legend of <clears throat> a wife from Shinoda, also called Kuzunaha, or um, this is very popular in Japanese theater. Uh, and performance arts. So a female fox is saved from death by a samurai, um, <clears throat> bears a son, Abenoseme, uh, who later becomes the most powerful uh, omnyoji or yin yang uh, master <clears throat> in Japan. Uh, the fox uh, mother must return to the forest uh, when her identity as a fox is discovered. In both these stories, uh, uh, this is uh, Abenosemi is the child uh, at the bottom here, uh, looking up at her mother, and you can see that uh, on the left that she's transformed. Uh, uh, her shadow is that of a fox, <clears throat> and the Shinoda forest is up at the top, and her husband is looking out from behind the screen. <clears throat> So in both of these uh, famous stories, the animal re which represents either the sea or the mountain has special powers and becomes the origin of a uh, <clears throat> powerful uh, lineage. But the, at the same time, uh, and with even perhaps even more frequency, uh, the same animal uh, can bring disaster to the community uh, and give the most famous example, uh, which is Tamamo no Mai. Uh, uh, Lady Tamamo, uh, she's uh, uh, a fox that appears as a beautiful woman, uh, becomes a concubine of um, the retired emperor, um, and endangers both the court and the state. Um, uh, and uh, creates a crisis uh, at court. Uh, the, the tale is uh, set in the late uh, Ham period. 
So the fox, which is the, probably the most prominent animal uh, in the Santo Yama besides birds, um, uh, possesses human beings, uh, deceives them, uh, and um, is frequently uh, and widely uh, <clears throat> illness and, and disease, uh, uh, <clears throat> collapse of families, et cetera. Is, uh, are often attributed to foxes and fox uh, possession. So the names of the foxes uh, differ uh, according to the area. Uh, one type is called Mujina. Um, and I'm gonna show, um, ooh, <laughs> I forgot to show this slide. So this is uh, Tamamo Mai, she's being uh, exercised by, Young, ma young master, and at the top, she's being hunted by a uh, samurai and they managed to kill her. Uh, so these are the two sides of the fox on one of the most pop, one of the most popular gods in all of Japan is the Inari uh, fox, but also on the right-hand side, the fox that transforms, uh, metamorphizes and uh, causes uh, disease and other uh, catastrophes. Uh, so I just want to turn to kind of contemporary Japan for a moment. Uh, so extensive uh, field work has been done at, uh, at Sado Island, uh, Niigata Prefecture, on Mujina uh, <clears throat> spirit uh, possession. And I cite from a, a, a study uh, by Nakanishi Yuji. <clears throat> uh, they sh the people of the village uh, and and. Uh, Sato, Sato Island is also famous for its Satoyama. So th this is occurring in the context of Satoyama. Um, <clears throat> so the people of the village considered the Mujina to be a four-legged animal, but uh, half animal and half non-animal. Uh, they didn't think it was an imaginary creature. Um, and <clears throat> in many cases, when someone falls ill, uh, uh, it's thought to, that they were possessed by a Mujina and medium is brought in to find out the cause. One case uh, recorded by Nakanishi, the Mujina says, uh, while I, quote, while I was sleeping in the mountain, uh, you came and disturbed me. That's a Mujina up at the <laughs> left here. Uh, while I was sleeping in the mountain, you came and disturbed me. On top of that, you had some fish, but didn't share even a piece of it with me, hmm. unquote. Uh, when the stricken person follows instructions and makes offerings to the Mujina, at the designated lo location, the illness um, disappears. So two issues uh, emerge here. One is that the human uh, who lives in the village uh, has invaded uh, the, the space or violated the space of the Mujina. Uh, who lives in the in the mountain or the forest? Uh, the second is that the mujina, the human, didn't share the food with the mujina, who is thought to have a voracious uh, appetite. Uh, you see in this slide uh, earlier depiction of the mujina, who's this one here, who's kind of transforming <clears throat> into human. Uh, <clears throat> in another case, it. Uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, Naka Nishi uh, records from Sado Island, certain man is passing by a village and he meets a, a young boy who es escort, escorts him to a, a splendid residence. When the man looks around after a while, he realizes he was sleeping at the edge of a well. Uh, and, and this kind of uh, um, episode appears repeatedly in the folklore and in the, in the literature. In both examples, um, the villager makes an offering to the Mujina or, and constructs a small shrine. Uh, that is to say the animal is uh, respected and wor worship and that resolves the crisis. Uh, so th this is a hokura, this is a small shrine. You find these in, in the forest. Uh, <clears throat> this is for a white snake that apparently protected this particular village. Uh, so uh, the 
extensive field by, by Japanese anthropologists, uh, not just on Mujin, but a, a, a range of uh, such uh, animal possession uh, <clears throat> phenomenon, shows that this kind of animistic logic from the pre-modern period uh, continues up uh, through the present. Um, in the Ed Edo period, the spirit of the animal that is senselessly killed uh, can seek revenge or punishment, uh, referred to as tatari, and, and possess the victimizer. Um, but as uh, <clears throat> the Japanese uh, uh, anthropologists have shown this kind of possessing animal, such as the Mujina, is more like a small god. Uh, it has, uh, it's a local god. Uh, it, it doesn't have huge powers or, or anything, uh, but it has a wild sign, okay, which can cause damage or illness or, or even death, and a peaceful sign, which can bring. Uh, benefits. So the wild spirit can seek revenge uh, or cause catastrophe, but if you show it respect uh, and or worship the animal as they do on Southern Island in certain villages, uh, or build a small shrine or do make offerings, the animal can become a protective uh, god or spirit and bring good fortune. So that brings you to uh, the Inari fox. So the possessing fox is not a constant evil. Uh, there's a downside um, that can be tolerated uh, since the animal usually has a positive uh, side as well. Just wanna turn to some more animals uh, in the Satoyama uh, that are non-marriageable. They don't appear as marriage partners. Um, that's to say that the relationship between humans and non-humans depends on uh, how th they uh, are situated <clears throat> with regard to the animal. So those in the uh, mountain recess or Okuyama, deep mountain, uh, they were hunted uh, and killed uh, and they do not appear for that reason uh, as marriage partners in the legends and literature. Uh, and uh, the, they also, in the folklore, uh, they also did not marry the oxen and horses who are basically uh, heavy uh, labor. Uh, and um, in the Buddhist uh, folk tales and what's called Setswa, the humans are reborn as oxen, ox or horse as, as punishment. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, and hunting, uh, but hunting, so there was this, uh, the re reciprocity, the mutual reciprocity that we saw in the other animals does not uh, uh, apply here. So this relationship uh, of the, the villagers to the animals um, in the Satoyama is quite different. Now, one of the um, uh, characteristics is that Japanese did not kill cows for food. Uh, they did not kill pigs or sheep. Uh, there was little um, herding except for horses, uh, which were used for transportation, sometimes uh, patiently eaten. Uh, so the, the situation in Japan is very different from uh, in the continent where the diet uh, depends on consumption of domestic uh, animals. Um, some of this has been attributed uh, to uh, Buddhism, uh, where it was a sin to uh, <clears throat> kill um, <clears throat> animals, um, and you can earn merit by not killing. Um, but uh, but I think this tendency already existed prior to Buddhism, uh, so it'd be better to say the Buddhist prohibition on killing. Uh, enforced an existing tendency to rely on vegetables and fish rather than uh, on meat. Uh, and, and the fact is that uh, uh, the Japanese ate uh, fish, shellfish, whales, birds, um, 
um, and there was a <clears throat> uh, Tendai Buddhist uh, notion in the medieval version of the medieval period that all things, uh, all living things, uh, uh, could achieve enlightenment, uh, and we see um, no place in which uh, um, <clears throat> this occurs. Uh, but this did not prevent uh, the villagers and uh, from extensively logging trees or hunting in. The, in, in the deep mountains. <clears throat> uh, instead, we have uh, this awareness of the sin of killing animals uh, and fish, okay, uh, and, what, and creating what I call the uh, culture of the afterlife. Um, so let me turn to that. Uh, yeah, so there, th this, this slide here at the very bottom, so on Honji, so, these very complex rationales for killing, uh, like if you kill a deer, it actually it helps the, the deer achieve uh, Buddhahood. <clears throat> uh, so I, I want to turn to the af issue of the afterlife, um, more kuyo or mortuary rites. Um, so farmers had to kill insects uh, and um, other animals uh, that uh, harm their rice fields. Um, uh, so uh, we have this extensive practice of mushikuyo or uh, memorials for insects that have been either killed or exterminated or driven out. And we have similar um, memorials or mortuary rites for for a wide range of animals. Um, and one of the fundamental conflicts in the medieval literature uh, is this conflict between the need to control nature, to get pressure to hunt, kill harmful animals, clear the forest, and the desire to appease and worship spirits of animals uh, and plants, which could cause uh, harm. And this is made even more complex by this Buddhist notion that Buddhist prohibition on uh, killing certain animals. Uh, and this could be compensated by uh, uh, mortuary rites or praying for the spirits of dead animals or by releasing uh, animals. So I just uh, read from one example um, of animal. Um, uh, Kuyo, uh, it, it's particularly uh, prominent when the animal is killed in a very unnatural, cruel way. Uh, so in this one example of a bear memorial from the early 18th century, a, a bear appears near a village, an official uh, orders the hunter to shoot the bear, and the hunter, who knows that the bear is pregnant, is very reluctant to shoot, but has to follow orders and kills the bear. And afterwards, the disease spreads in the village. Uh, and realizing that the illness, uh, the disease was a result of killing the bear, the villagers erect a grave mound uh, for the bear. So killing uh, animals is part of the ecosystem. Uh, there's no hesitation about the need uh, to kill animals. But when the balance between respect and, uh, and killing is broken, uh, disaster occurs. Um, for example, uh, in a recent case, it was believed that if you killed a thousand wild boar or deer, one met uh, disaster. So uh, this kind of served as a check on inhumane killing. Um, and I just, uh, nearby in y Yushima, uh, you can go and, and see all these tombs to, uh, to animals. This is on, on the right. It's on the birds. Uh, uh, I think this is chickens for all the yakitori places in Tokyo, uh, feeling guilty. Fish tomb on the left, one for fugu. Uh, uh, here's one for carp, koi. Uh, these are particular places where they produce carp uh, for uh, consumption. <clears throat> this is one for... Uh, whales. Uh, and th this one's very striking is contemporary scientists uh, who uh, 
uh, carrying out CLIO for the mice and rats that they have been experimenting on. And um, so the CLIO is, uh, it's a gesture of thanks or gratitude uh, to the animals that have been sacrificed for research, but at a deeper level, I think it also reflects the scientist's awareness of taking, having taken life uh, and the fear of the power of animals to bring uh, disaster. Uh, the, um, okay. Um, the, the point I want to make here is the extensive practice of Kuyo mortuary rights for animals was not because the Japanese were kinder to nature or to animals or lived in harmony with, uh, with nature, but because they believed the animals had the same kind of emotions that humans had resentment, anger, sense of injustice, etc. The animals were treated as non-human persons. Uh, and by persons, I don't mean living people, but rather non-human species that have, uh, are thought to have uh, emotions and agency. The assumption is that humans and animals are different species with different bodies, uh, but they share a common type of interiority. And that interiority includes both a peaceful side and a wild side or dangerous sign. Uh, I'm going to give a quick, um, what's kind of interesting to me is that this Cleo or mortuary rights also extends to uh, human-made objects, use utensils. This is a Tsukumogami, very famous <clears throat> tale in the late uh, medieval period in which used kitchen, abandoned kitchen utensils uh, and turn into uh, vengeful spirits because they feel they have not been uh, properly recognized for uh, what they've done for the family. Uh, here's another, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so what's interesting here is that this is not animals, it's not plants or trees, um, but objects. And it, it, this occurs in a, uh, late medieval, early uh, Edo period, um, <clears throat> when there's, it appears that there's kind of a transition from um, natural surroundings to more kind of urban uh, artisan uh, culture. Uh, and, and modern example of uh, mortuary rites for uh, human-made objects are the hariki kuyo, uh, you see uh, uh, women, I believe it is it's, it's, uh, at a uh, <clears throat> coming to a shrine and the uh, broken needles or used needles are put in uh, in the tofu and, and uh, so they will not, uh, <clears throat> they have a kind of soft landing, so to speak. Um, and there are more examples of, uh, here's one, uh, uh, kitchen knives, uh, here's one for uh, used glasses. Um, so this the term kuyo here is translated mortuary rights, but it, its meaning is much broader meaning payback or um, show of gratitude for all the service of the uh, utensils. Um, and most of all, it's recognition that the life of such an object uh, does not end with its use value. Uh, they, ha they have an afterlife, uh, similar to animals, birds, and so forth. Um, so uh, just kind of summarize this part here. Um, the ethics of the pre-modern Satoyama was based on uh, reciprocity uh, between human and non-human. The reciprocity in the positive sense is uh, most evident in these many, many interspecies uh, marriage <clears throat> stories, particularly what's called the ongaishi or uh, debt repayment stories in which a human or animal uh, repays a debt uh, to the other species. The negative reciprocity is evident in the stories of natural disaster uh, caused by mountains, trees, animals, even discarded uh, 
objects that are angered by the behavior of humans, um, uh, lack of respect. Uh, so if the non-human, whether it's an animal or, or mountain, is not respected properly, it brings uh, dis destruction. And the pre-moderns understood they did not have complete control over the non-human. Uh, instead, they showed the respect for the non-human, both for the positive and the negative sides, through annual rites, uh, observations, offerings, um, little shrines, and uh, also uh, these kuyo mortuary uh, rites. So I want to kind of give my last uh, major example here uh, by saying a few words about the new film uh, that's in theaters now. Uh, Shinkai Makoto's Suzume no Tojimari, uh, which brings up many of the issues I've been uh, talking about. Um, the anime centers on a young girl, Suzume, and her companion, Sota, um, <clears throat> and a white cat, Daijin, who is the uh, rock, uh, kame, kaname ishi, the rock that is believed to hold down uh, the earthquake. The film centers on abandoned places, Haikyo especially the space behind, uh, behind the ushiro door, or the back door. Um, and the, the back door, this is the, and you can see the back door here. Um, it's the dwelling places of the gods that caused the earthquake, as well as the home of the spirits of the dead. And the teenage uh, protagonist, uh, Suzume, <clears throat> um, she's lost her mother in the 311 total disaster. And, and uh, <clears throat> she is able to uh, meet her mother in this, uh, in the uh, space um, behind the, <clears throat> the ushiro no. So Shinkai Makoto draws on two uh, kind of pre traditional views of natural disaster. One is the idea of the earthquake as a type of dragon or serpent. The other is this notion of the kanameshi or the earthquake um, holding rock. So in the medieval period, um, dragons or serpents were thought to dwell in the sea, lake, marshes, rivers, waterfalls. Uh, and <clears throat> they're manifestations of local uh, spirits or gods. Um, in the Heian period, they became water gods um, and they were prayed to for water. Um, the, the the serpents and dragons also defended uh, protected Japan from invasion from by the Mongols, but when the same serpents um, were angered, they caused earthquakes uh, and volcanic explosions, <clears throat> uh, and uh, a, a very long uh, serpent dragon was thought to wrap his body around the island of uh, Japan. <clears throat> Uh, and to protect it, but if it was angered, it could squeeze the country, uh, causing an earthquake. Um, and the, the, there's an earthquake uh, holding rock pinned to the head that's on the far left here. Um, and in the Edo period, it's replaced by the namazu or catfish. Um, so one on the conception of the film, film Shinkai Makoto notes that in Japan, quote, it is customary to hold a jichinsai before uh, groundbreaking ceremony, before construction, built uh, on a new home as an everyday occurrence in Japan. Um, <clears throat> but we do nothing when we close down uh, a house or build, unquote. So Shinkai uh, noticed that there were many abandoned places uh, due to, I guess, Japan's uh, declining uh, birth rate, et cetera. Uh, so he uh, decided to do this anime about <clears throat> uh, mourning uh, deserted places. And uh, he also feared that people's memories of the Tohoku disaster would come hazy uh, <clears throat> and they would look. Uh, so he, he put together this anime. So, um, and the kind of, the lost memories recovered through this encounter with the earthquake god at the abandoned uh, place. So in the Jijinsai, here, here you see it. Um, 
um, is literally uh, means calming the spirits of the place. Uh, so pr pr prayers are made to the God of the place uh, that both protects the place, but also causes and cause disaster. And in the climactic scene at an abandoned place, uh, so it, um, the, the male protagonist makes a prayer to the God of the place who causes earthquakes, thanking the God for lending the land to live on. Shinkai implies here that prayer must be held not only for the deceased, but for the God of uh, the place or soil, which brings disaster, but also brings bounty to the land. And the, there's significantly, there's an animal, Daijin, uh, who plays an important role. So Shinkai Makunta makes clear that we cannot forget those who died in not 311, but we cannot also cannot forget where the earthquake uh, comes from. This has been one of the highest grossing films <clears throat> this year. Uh, it's a very good example of uh, how storytelling, which I believe is at the heart of humanities, can play a major role in uh, <clears throat> making natural horror uh, understandable, in renewing uh, cultural memory, and also in shaping our views of uh, the environment. And it belongs to a, a line of what I would call eco um, anime, which are very good at showing non human uh, perspectives. Um, so I want to turn to the conclusion. Um, so, historically, uh, we can say there are three major ways uh, in which. Um, natural disaster was uh, interpreted <clears throat> uh, in particularly in the pre-modern period. One was kind of a Buddhist framework, uh, karmic causality, in which disaster was regarded as punishment for some moral violation or uh, <clears throat> sin. The other was uh, the result, the disaster result was a result of a breach in obligation uh, or a failure of reciprocity um, and brings about self-reflection and a need for renewal of the social contract. Uh, the third part, third reason <clears throat> uh, is uh, it's attributed to that uncontrollable part of nature as the aramitama or wild spirit uh, of the kami. <clears throat> uh, and significantly, this aramitama or wild spirit always has the potential to become a uh, nikimitama or a peaceful, protective spirit. Um, and these three reasons are often combined uh, or, or in, in some way. Um, <clears throat> So the natural disaster uh, was a painful uh, reminder to respect the non-human, whether it be mountain, animal, or gigantic tree. Um, respect the non-human in all its dimensions and observe a mutual relationship through uh, observances, rites, and other means. In the matsuri or celebration of local gods, uh, was as much a preventive device as it was a restorative process. Uh, the other point, uh, <clears throat> Japan is uh, a country very deeply uh, concerned with defilement as well as renewal. Um, and defilement was thought to come with contact with death, blood, serious illness, natural disaster, war. Um, and one of the central rights um, of Japan is the misogi uh, lustration or harai, the purification, which is carried out at the edge of a uh, riverbank, uh, seashores uh, or, or uh, waterfall, and it, it washes away the defilement and enables a, a reset. I think this notion of the reset is very important. Um, and in Japan's cultural imagination, the hot springs, uh, onsen, which were found in the mountains, uh, particularly volcanic mountains, uh, had two sides. 
So on the one hand, and the hot springs were reminiscent of uh, kind of a, a, a Buddhist hell on earth. <clears throat> and they had names such as Hell Valley, Jigokudani. <clears throat> but on the other hand, the hot springs uh, and hot baths, uh, which become part of Japanese, important part of Japanese culture from the medieval period, um, the hot baths and hot springs were thought to cure illness and other defilements. Um, so, for example, uh, pilgrimage to a sacred mountain such as Kumano uh, accumulated in a bath uh, in the hot springs, which enabled rebirth, as in the famous uh, legend of Oguri Hangan. Um, and also, uh, the pilgrimage to Kumano was also part of uh, Shugendo, or mountain worship. Um, and I think the mountain worship is important here. It's not just another uh, religion. Uh, it, it teaches that the power of nature, uh, which is frightening and dangerous, can also be a source of purification, new life, and lasting health. Uh, so historically, natural disasters uh, called for renewal by return to nature, especially the mountain and the sea, which are the two central pillars of Japan's natural environment. So in the conclusion, four, um, I've kind of narrowed down to four key points here, uh, which I'll talk about. Uh, first is animistic logic and the recognition of personhood in the non-human. Uh, then uh, storytelling is a key medium, uh, however indirect for transmitting perspectives uh, <clears throat> the perspective of the non-human, uh, the social nature of uh, interspecies relations and the ethics of the uncontrollable. So the, um, the term animism, I, the point here I wanna make is that scientific, economic and political novel models are not enough. Other systems of knowledge, particularly those rooted in long standing beliefs about human non-human relations, particularly local beliefs about mountains, uh, trees, and animals, what I call animistic logic, are keys to both motivation and action. The term animism earned a very negative reputation when um, Edward T Tyler, one of the founding anthropologists, associated animism with primitive religion and the lowest level of uh, cultural development but in recent years, a revised definition of animism, particularly one that stresses, stresses relational uh, uh, relations, uh, often it's the new animism, as is often called, uh, has animism has become a positive term uh, used by widely by anthropologists such as uh, Marshall Solons and others to mean the recognition of personhood in the non-human. Uh, and that is a key concept in environmental justice. So this personhood can extend from animals to mountains and rivers. Uh, uh, it's, and, um, it's often associated by culture anthropologists with uh, hunter and gatherer societies, but we find traces of it here even in advanced uh, civilizations. Um, we cannot go back to the past, that's obvious, uh, but animistic logic, I think, is a key perspective today in linking humans to non-humans, particularly generating a, what I would call, empathetic and ethical relationship to all around us. Uh, I just give one example here, and I owe this to Professor Naga, uh, <clears throat> of <clears throat> a river uh, uh, that <clears throat> has been uh, recognized legally as a person. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, in this particular case, uh, the Maori uh, <clears throat> uh, had saw the river as their uh, ancestor and <clears throat> eventually a ruling was made uh, that to recognize that, uh, and this was after many, many years of the failure of what the kind of modern Western view of uh, 
uh, Mount uh, River as property. Uh, uh, humanities uh, storytelling is a major vehicle. I think this kind of speaks for itself. Um, <clears throat> Um, so I'm going to, because I'm running out of time, I'm going to move on here. Uh, <clears throat> the non-human uh, understood socially, uh, the relationship, <clears throat> the humans and non-humans are closely intertwined uh, in what we could call a monistic universe uh, in which good and evil is very situational. Uh, gods can become demons, demons can become gods. Uh, the wild spirit, Aratmitama, can become a protective spirit, etc. Um, there's this uh, larger community of human and non-human that's ordered through uh, these social relations of obligation, uh, oftentimes compromise, sometimes contract. Um, and as we've seen, these social values, particularly ethics of reciprocity, are central to the ecology of Satoyama and Sato Umi. And the Kuyo, the mortuary rites, I believe, is, is a means by which humans acknowledge the personhood of a human, non human, particularly the sacrifice of a non human. Um, and last, um, and <clears throat> again, this I uh, owe this to Professor Nava. Uh, there's uh, a connection here to um, multi-species ethnography, which I'm going to skip over here. Um, so last but not least, uh, a viable um, in environment ethics must address both controllable and uncontrollable, which is a theme that's repeated over and over again, both in belief systems, local belief systems, and in the storytelling tradition. Mountains bring water to the fields, but they also cause landslides, floods, fish bring, sea brings fish, but it also causes uh, disaster. Uh, and <clears throat> the shrine gates facing the sea are not simply because they're thanking the sea for bringing fish, but they fear the storm, high waves, and other disasters. Um, Awe and fear are a key part in the non human non human relationship. And the Satoyama is not always a place of harmony between human and non human. A wild animal, a wild river, a wild ma mountain may cause death at any moment. Uh, reciprocity between human and non human is necessary, but there is no guaranteed outcome, and there will always be fear of not having done enough. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much for your fascinating lecture. Actually, uh, uh, it, it was so rich and uh, you have shown many uh, examples of the relation between human and nature. Um, actually, these are quite a new kind of light for me to rethink the relation between nature and uh, the human. Uh, now, I would like to invite Dr. Fukunaga Mayumi, who is an associate professor at Graduate School of Frontier Sciences, University of Tokyo. Dr. Fukunaga specializes in environmental sociology and ethics, especially focusing on environmental values and social norms in the context of natural resource management. So uh, I believe that Dr. Fukunaga definitely has some questions and uh, comments on uh, Professor Shiana's talk. Um, Sensei, please. Yeah. The first of all, thank you for your fascinating and stimulating lecture today. It's so rich. So we have a lot of you know discussions we can have from now with audience. But uh, as an environmental sociologist and applied ethicist, I would like to hear make uh, some comments uh, to his lecture and open up the new discussion with audience from now. So um, I have been working on the relationships between people and nature and its uh, lived world as seen through the eyes of a certain single species like salmon, rainbow trout, and seaweed wakame. And those are the my actual stories protagonist as an you know, academic expert. The ethics between humans and non-human is rooted, as Dr. Shirane already has argued, 
in the experiential and cultural imaginaries of nature and the worldview that nurtures those. In particular, that the last two decades have been a series of academic transmissions from regions with former colonial experiences in conjunction with social movements such as decolonization, restoration of autonomy, indigenous community revitalization, or food sovereignty even. So the new animism that Dr. Shirane describes arises in this new movement, questioning the category of nature culture and exploring the relationships and objects that politically define them. On the other hand, we are in a situation today where the design of a sustainable society is left to science, technology, market forces, and our freedom of choices as consumers. As the spread of the term Anthropocene, such as humans are now considered equal players with the earth, wielding power alongside the geological forces that have shaped the planet. And ideas such as ecological modernization or protopia presented by American digital culture thinker Kevin Kelly proposed to create the Earth as a better world for humans using the power of science, technology, and markets that have allowed them to penetrate deeper into the Earth system. So just like we can renew the world from the deep Environment and ruins when we use science technology, they say. In those kind of the current, you know, the, um, so to speak, the science technology and the uh, force of the market streams, the animistic thinking and the Satoyan vision as a symbol of harmonious human nature relationships are referenced as a source of imagination that shapes these better world for humans. It opens new capitalism and is even consumed as a resource to cultivate nationalism. Perhaps a new future lies ahead of these attempts. Personally, I doubt it. <laughs> but it also brings us anxiety and suspicion, of course. With such re-enchantment of the world, we can call like that, by science, technology, and market economy, be further exploitation or colonialism emerging under the political regime of the climate crisis and the realization of a sustainable society. While we are attracted to the new animistic thinking, we cannot fail to be wary of it. So in my understanding, therefore, Dr. Shirane does not picture the new animistic thinking as a site of harmonious satoyama, a peaceful relationships with non-human creatures. Instead, he explores Satoyama as a site of conflict and disasters. For him, it is a place where things and animals that have personalities relate with tensions. He depicts two circulating systems, in my understanding, the system of rebirth and the system of haunting. The doctrine shows a separation of these systems, which humans cannot fully depict. Still, the power of storytelling would illustrate it much better than science does. Such complexity and depth that men cannot know and depict the shape nature that bring us bounty and disasters. His challenges is uh, protest against the mixed forces of science technology and the market that makes others and the world legible and simplified for humans. Or resistance against achieving sustainability by remaking the earth with such anthropogenic rationality. In that sense, rethinking the new animistic thinking is a core of the environmental justice movement, surely, as Dr. Shirane shortly suggests. However, the audience might not quite um, good catch uh, why telling the story of animistic thinking can be fundamental to environmental justice. I will bridge the gap between the new animistic thinking and the idea of environmental justice more than more uh, from Michiko Ishimura's writing and thoughts a little bit. And this can invite us to deeper discussions with this, uh, with Dr. Shirane, I believe. Um, as the Michiko Ishimura know really well, um, uh, well known as uh, Japan's most representative artist and a novelist of environmental humanities. In her numerous works, he depicted, she depicted the destructive suffering of survivors of Minamata disease, of course, and not the non-human wars that have sustained local communities. Her descriptions tell us about the dense and emotionally rich interactions between people and non-humans and the polyphonic world of the living and the dead. 
how writing is shamanistic and you will see something you want to call a force of nature or something affectionate but scarce simultaneously trickling down from between her sentences. I want to introduce a very impressive episode from Tsubaki no Umi no Ki, Chronicles of the Sea Where Camellia Blooms, which describes her childhood. Little Michiko, um, in the works, she called herself Michin. Michin goes to the seaside with her grandfather and sees an abandoned boat that her family once owned. The abandoned ship lies rooting, uh, rotting on the shore. However, the keel is still alive and has become a dwelling place for other living creatures, seaweeds, crabs, fish, etc., etc. Et the grandfather said that, that this boat had worked hard for Michin's family. And he told Michin the story of keel. The grandpa said, the tree which grew up in the high mountain and it never hit by lightning became the keel. Apparently, the abandoned ship is still alive as a resource of storytelling of non-humans, as a player that nurtures other lives. The conversation between Michin and his grandpa about such an abundant ship is very impressive. I really recommend to read it to the audience. And um, they, they say, the Michin just questioned her grandpa, why is this ship always alone, not with the other ship in the harbor? Grandpa told, because this ship worked enough for humans. So she rests herself. She finished her role as a ship. I just used the she, her, her, but uh, actually I'm not sure, but I do not want to use it, it, it. So <laughs> I actually would like to show some, not humanized, but some kind of the personhood by Dr. Shinone here. So I use the she. But anyway, so the ship lives after life, we can say, I think. The readers, we learn, when we read the books, we learn the ship is not abundant. Ishimura father writes, the keel seemed more alive in its afterlife as abundant, with a kind of aspiration to live by its own will, rather than wait when it was had been a perfect ship. In Kukai Jodo, other Ishimura's masterpiece, there is a description of both that is almost opposite from this lively afterlife of the ship. A description about new fishing boats that were discarded due to the fishing ban in Minamata Bay. Ishimura wrote the fact plainly and said, she saw the terrible weathering and the dismantling of the boats. However, instead of her writing without any emotional words, the scene is very scary. Compared with the kill's colorful afterlife, this boat stays in the great world without any lives near around it. Fishermen from other districts look at those boats and said, it's like a graveyard of boards, freaking me out, and fear that their own boats might end up like this. There is no future for those boats, unlike the afterlife of Michin's family boats. Time passes equally for every human and non-human, and by relating with others, I can grow, live, and even have an afterlife with humans and non-humans around me. Then I can become humans as I am. I can be a part of streams of life and a voice of the afterlife to contribute to other beings' lives and the rebirth. Isn't that what it means for humans to become human? Sense of belonging to the world, where I can be human with others and my life can connect to others, even transcending time. Ishimura told repeatedly in her works, this is what the victim of Minamata have been deprived of. Mm -hmm. The victims wanted to prove their existence as they lived with a sense of belonging to the world. To be deprived of the world in which we can commune with non-human surrounding us and keep nurturing animistic logic. This is uh, what the environmental injustice is all about for Ishimura. The approach to animistic logic by multiple social movements, including the climate justice movement so far, shows their resistance to the uprooting from the such world and great aspirations to take root again and embed themselves into the world again. 
This also has a significant meaning in Japan, considering the repeatedly ruined mountains, rivers, and seas by human desires, especially when we consider the ongoing devastation caused by the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident. The abandoned ship stories suggest what injustice is clearly. When we see the devastated houses where nobody can stay, we hear voices of haunting. So um, the, in the Suzume's lockup, actually the, some streets from the Fukushima yeah, escapes actually can, came up and we can see that kind of the uh, devastation and how that movie uh, depicts that kind of devastation anyway. So the finally, inspired by Dr. Shirani's research, I now understand again why I have been attracted to animals, fish, plants, even microbes. <laughs> <laughs> Living things themselves serve as a medium of memory. What I might talk, I, why, what I might call, and I want to call the ecology of afterlife. Every year, the lock uh, chirps, the mosquito pole rises in summer. Maybe soon you can experience it. It's very annoying. <laughs> and char are still in the pools, passing a raccoon duck in my backyard. Cherry blossom tree that we can remember from generation to generation bloom grow leaves and bear fruit every year. The living creatures that continue to live there, responding changes of land forms, human activities cause even, are themselves a storages of memories for humans and non-humans, of course. For example, long-lived trees can remember others' afterlives, even can become triggers for us to remember such voices of afterlives. Such layers of voices within species attract me a lot. So I keep writing ethnography of us and non-human others. And in my ambitions, Nine Fox Tales, it might be very interesting <laughs> ethnographic target anyway. And uh, at the same time, when I had a field work and conversations with producers, the always it is very clear that the ocean, mountains, rivers are also horrifying. At the same time, they are also convinced that our inability to read and understand, you know, the inability to read and understand is the source of nature's bounty as well as its horror. So we cannot fully understand such kind of the nature, but the, we cannot understand because of that, we can have bounty and a lot of rich resources from those. So, the, after the March, March 11, 2011 tsunami, uh, my fieldwork site was, uh, is in Iwate Prefecture. So, so many survivors um, told me a lot of stories, but uh, repeatedly they told me after tsunami, wakame seaweed and oysters do better. Mm -hmm. A comment that while fearing the power of the waves to overturn the seafloor, as you know, they are very sure of the magnitude of the blessings that this power brings to. And I noticed that sea or wave spoken of at such times has always personhood. <laughs> I don't know if this personhood expression is appropriate because it actually has a person, <laughs> as you know. It might be better to say just others as mm -hmm. some cultural anthropologist you know, is talking. Mm. Um, because they are the other who speaks, mm. they will suffer if neglected, mm. but they are not human. Mm. So we cannot understand how it moves, how it responds, how it can, you know, have next, well, the rebirth. So they, um, because they are others who live in a different time and space from humans, and even as you show, the hybrids of materials and imaginaries, just like nine tail foxes or Mujina, mm -hmm. or even the some, you know, the mm -hmm. needle <laughs> or you know, some kitchen tools. Um, but surely they can become the remembering mm -hmm. that transcends but sustains the human world. So I would like to say maybe ecology of afterlives or ecology of no humans can give me, give us a lot of, you know, the uh, new thinking path for sustainable society. And just only 
the method of the storytelling can connect us to that kind of a new world beyond science technology, I believe. So that is my short uh, comment. And, uh, and, and at last, your lecture really gave me many new hints for my research in particularly environmental ethics. So thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fukunaga. I'm sure that Professor Shirya may, uh, may have some uh, response to her. And uh, even though the time is limited, I think uh, you can start the conversation uh, freely from now on. I, I will not disturb you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But thank you for those comments. They're very rich. Um, and I do want to pursue Ishimura Misko um, more in connection mm -hmm. with this. Okay. Uh, one issue that you brought up was the question, the personhood, is this the right word? Uh, yeah, so I've struggled with this from the very beginning. Yeah. One of the problems in Japanese is when you translate personhood into Japanese, um, the most frequently used translation is jinkaku, mm. and jin has a character for person mm -hmm. i mean human being yes okay so th that's not really good translation because it all the translation the japanese anthropomorphizes mm -hmm. uh personhood and you know one of the major points of personhood is this non-anthropomorphic exactly. uh, i mean old animism tended to be mm -hmm. very anthropomorphizing uh, mm -hmm. uh, but I think the point of the new animism is that it's trying to get away from that. Right. Uh, so we need to come up with a term that's better than personhood. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, other is another alternative, but that's also kind of exactly too broad. <laughs> uh, so we need to get. Uh, come up with some new terms. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the main thing here is this recognition of non-human, but not necessarily, you know, taking the form of humans or uh, others kind of becoming shaped as humans or thought of as humans, but rather. Uh, and, and also that personhood, I, I like the, the, the example of the river because it's clearly non-anthropomorphic. Exactly. Uh, and I think that's one of the main points is that there's a very wide range of person, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the personhood of a salmon, okay, which is your one of your specialties, that's very different, yes, right? From very different. personhood of a fox or personhood of, of a river. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it um, you know, as you show, songs and poetry and all these things can uh, provide a view of the uh, uh, salmon <laughs> as um, in terms of uh, personhood. Uh, yeah, and I, I think the other main topic that you brought up at the very beginning is, you know, how can someone who's so deeply embedded in humanity, such as myself, mm -hmm. uh, you know, connect with um, scientists, right? Uh, environmental scientists, and um, so I think you, you've, you've. I'm very grateful that you've made some connections where this can uh, develop further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have another question to you, actually, about the rivers. Yeah. So the, when we think about the another the very popular movie, Miyazaki Hayao's Spirited Away, yeah. Sento Chihiro no Kamikakushi in Japanese, that there is a god of the river, mm -hmm. Aku. So I might imagine that the, to anthropomorphize, mm -hmm. not really, but maybe god morphy. <laughs> <laughs> God-like, you know, that's all that's, yeah. so the, the, how can I say, passing through the idea of the God, yeah. 
that they can have more the different personality. Well, not the personality, yeah. but <laughs> but different yeah. character, even yeah. beyond the humans, but still connect with the, some kind of the emotional yeah. or some the behaviors with humans. Yeah, so that's also a very important point, mm -hmm. um, which is the translation for the word kami. Yeah. Right? So the standard translation is God, but in English, you know, God is this mm -hmm. all powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, and but actually, in Japanese, you and I can become a kami, right? And 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 so could a a, a flower, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a very different conception of that kind God. of yeah. uh, personhood with certain amount of power. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the the word God is just in, in, insufficient, right? Mm -hmm. And it has um so uh yeah so i think uh elaborating more on the possibilities of kami as related personhood mm -hmm. would also uh, be very helpful in the future mm -hmm. <laughs> bridging uh humanities and mm -hmm. environmental sciences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So maybe we can open up the Q and A, or the can we no, not yet, or well, we can actually, we can continue the discussions. Yes, yes uh, if you I'm very confident. You know, I can keep all actually. Okay. Yes, <laughs> you know, the, all the, because uh, uh, yeah. I I I think the uh, oh sorry I I think the one very important keyword mm -hmm. in in this conversation mm -hmm. is uh, personal food mm -hmm. and uh, um, I, actually this uh, word is uh, quite new to me mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm completely outside of the uh, this field right. and uh, but but uh, it's really interesting so, to see this person food in all these uh, natural matters or non-human matters mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, is this way of thinking is quite common in this field, and 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 uh, the, I'm I'm quite uh, curious about the fact that the translation of personhood is not jinkaku, and there is no uh, right word to express personhood. That that's very interesting mm. to me. How, how, how we uh, can start the discussions? Maybe the. Then maybe the discussing point maybe the be... Christopher Stone. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, so uh, actually, Professor Fukunaga, um, we had an earlier discussion that Christopher Stone is a, a lawyer, a legal scholar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's 1974. Yeah. Uh, wrote this very uh, article that became very influential in which he argued for personhood of trees. Uh, and, and so that's been taken up. Uh, so he was using personhood to refer to personhood as in uh, companies can have personhood. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, within the legal field, it was personhood was already established term. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? Yeah, it's a natural rights discussion, we call, we, uh, mm -hmm. so to speak, we call. And uh, there are another um, idea that, uh, you know, that we see things as something instrumental values that have right so we can use anything as a tool so we can find this is valuable that is instrumental value we call but the intrinsic value on the other hand uh the western particularly the environmental ethics um made such kind of a concept that because the living things are living things. So they have their intrinsic values. Nobody can say anything about that value <laughs> from outside. So itself has a value that is intrinsic value. So that CRISPR stones the a person put to the trees, the natural rights of the trees, basically with the idea of intrinsic value. So it's just like a human. The, you know, as a human race, nobody actually can, you know, the affect influence, the right is yours, right? So that um, that kind of idea is the background. So it's very complicated because as a New Zealand case, that uh, act, uh, apparently Aboriginal people use their own the word myth mm. or their own the rituals 
or their own the ideas about nature to express the personhood of the river. So it's a kind of a hybrid of the Western idea of the natural rights and that kind of the Aboriginal, the um, expression of the, well, not the person like, but uh, some rivers as rivers. So those are the very sometimes difficult to see what is actually personhood. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm I, I'm afraid that I opened up a very complicated <laughs> discussion, and uh, uh, in, in fact, uh, we are running out of okay. time. And and, and the, the, the the professor Shirane, would you like to say a few last words? Uh, uh, I, I just want to thank Professor Fukunaga for mm -hmm. uh, helping to bridge <laughs> the humanities and uh, uh, environmental sciences, and I hope that. Uh, we can continue to do this kind of yeah. interdisciplinary uh, mm -hmm. uh, work. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very sorry for the audience because uh, they, they definitely expect more the uh, stories from Dr. Sharanid's really rich stories. But uh, we can actually continue the conversations and uh, we can have some writing or uh, and maybe audience can catch up the uh, another discussions of Dr. Sharan is really I'm sure so um thank you for again the year which really um very insightful lecture thank you so much uh okay uh I think it's time to close the uh the session and uh, I again uh would like to uh, express my sincere thanks to uh Professor Shirane and also, I'd like to extend my thanks to uh, Dr. Fukunaga for their uh, excellent and uh, uh, stimulating, wonderful contribution. Uh, we really enjoy uh, the, the session. Uh, thank you very much. By this, I would like to close uh, the session. Thank you very much. Thank you.